is a mini PC for around $190 really as bad as many people assume and claim? What are the pros and cons? What are those exactly? Surely such a device simply cannot turn out to be complete garbage, or can it? That's what we are going to talk about today. The model being tested today goes by the name of Ninkier N10, which you can currently pick up for 179 euros on Geek Maxi over here in Europe. Depending on when you check, it can sometimes be had for less. However, there are seemingly countless comparable and similar devices that are almost identical in terms of hardware and similarly priced. As expected, at the heart of this mini PC is the widely used Intel N100 quad-core CPU, 16GB of RAM and a 512GB SSD. I'll not only conduct brief everyday tests, but also cover the gaming experience with it, as well as the features, ports, upgradability, power consumption, temperatures and finally, the noise levels. Should you ultimately stay away from such a cheap mini PC, or are many people out there just exaggerating? I'll tell you right away, both applies here. It really depends on your personal requirements. The scope of delivery is a bit more scarce this time around. The mini PC, a power supply rated at 36 watts, and some paper documentation. There's no HDMI cable or any VESA mounting bracket included. Now right from the start I have to say that the aesthetics of the Ninkier N10 are extremely simple, rather uninspired one could say. That impression is largely conveyed by the cheap looking yet fairly sturdy plastic case. With dimensions of 106 by 114 by 45 mm, the mini PC is certainly quite compact. As already mentioned, it features an Intel N100 processor with 4 cores and Intel UHD graphics. The RAM is 16GB of DDR4 at 2666 megatransfers per second. Due to only one memory slot being available here and due to DDR4 technology, unfortunately we are running in single channel mode here. A no-name SSD with a capacity of 512GB comes into play. It's one in the M.2 form factor, but say the 6 gigabits per second. The read and write speeds, however, are pretty decent. Oh, and while VESA mounting is not an option here, the device at least can be hung on the wall. Fortunately, accessing the antennas inside is quite easy. Simply loosen four screws on the bottom and then pull off the bottom cover. Here we have easy access to the SSD, CMOS battery and the RAM. However, I noticed there's a second M.2 slot available on the motherboard, which even allows for the longer form factor. That's really nice for potential upgrades or expansions down the line. I also noticed that a bottom cover has guides and holes for a 2.5 inch drive, but such is not supported here. Perhaps they've just gone with a standard case the manufacturer is reusing. Now let's talk ports. On the front, right next to the power button, we get two USB 3.2 Gen 1 ports and on the opposite side, on the rear, 3.5mm audio, two HDMI 2.0, a gigabit LAN port and finally a single USB 3.2 Gen 1 and USB 2.0 port respectively. Disguised as a ventilation cutout hole, there's also a Kensington lock. Unfortunately, there's no sign of USB Type-C or an SD card reader. Actually, that's not uncommon for devices in this price range. Regarding wireless connectivity, we are unfortunately blessed with only Wi-Fi 5 and sadly just Bluetooth 5.0. Well, it is somewhat okay. All the more impressive then that Windows 11 Pro comes pre-installed. We are running the version 23H2 out of the box. But what about the license behind that? It was activated using a volume mock key. I've heard mixed feelings from the community about that. Some people never have any issue with it, while others find themselves with their copy of Windows not activated after a while, forcing them to buy a new license key themselves. So it's best to view that aspect with caution. I also exercised caution with regard to pre-installed bloatware slash third-party programs, but in reality this appears to be a clean Windows installation. Not even the Microsoft Edge web browser comes with an extension pre-installed. I didn't notice any suspicious background processes or services running, 
Nonetheless, a healthy dose of caution and skepticism never hurts, and so I ran three individual virus scans using Windows Defender slash security, Malwarebytes and Norton 360. No threats were detected. The UEFI BIOS is somewhat praiseworthy. I would have expected a fully locked down BIOS with no options for optimizing a few things ourselves. While the BIOS still doesn't offer much, there are at least a few settings for power limits and the fan curve at our disposal. Now under full load, the Intel N100 CPU initially clocks up to 2.9 GHz. Two minutes later, however, the clock speed drops noticeably down to 2.7 GHz and fluctuates considerably from time to time. It is therefore not at all surprising that today's Ninkier N10 with the Intel N100 CPU falters even among similar devices. This is undoubtedly due to the CPU clock speed, which isn't maintained very stably over time. In practice, however, this mini PC doesn't perform fundamentally worse than other N100 CPU based devices. This is not a compliment though, because you do have to live with limitations in many aspects. 4K UHD videos and movies play back perfectly and smoothly, but if you wish to perform more complex, more demanding tasks such as image and video editing, then things can get tight. The CPU is quickly pinned to 100% usage and god forbid if there are programs running in the background that eat up even more CPU resources. I am not saying it is impossible to edit or render images and videos, but only in moderation and without great expectations. The only area things can go downhill further is in 3D applications like games. Gaming is virtually impossible at Full HD 1080p, at least when giving AAA titles a shot. Unfortunately, lowering the resolution down to 720p doesn't help much either. It's simply the combination of CPU and integrated graphics that is too weak. But that doesn't mean gaming is entirely impossible. No, because more lightweight game titles, including many indie games, can be played smoothly at 1080p even with a decent frame rate. Let's talk power consumption, temperatures and noise levels. The power draw is extremely low. At full load, we remain below 30 watts. Temperatures, meanwhile, are perfectly fine. We are noticeably below the 80 degrees Celsius mark. The fan also does its job fairly quietly. While it is audible at higher loads, it can be described as pleasant. While idling and under light loads, the fan is spinning constantly, but at 39 decibels is virtually inaudible. Compared to a desktop PC that already can be considered as more power efficient, this entry-level mini PC consumes remarkably fewer power. Conclusion. That sums it up quite well. In this price range, we are definitely talking about an entry-level product. You shouldn't expect any more than that. The Ninkier N10, as well as many comparable mini PCs on the market, simply delivers okay-ish performance. We can't consider it good necessarily, but claiming it's unusable or bad isn't right either, if you ask me. One can definitely get some stuff done with the N100 CPU. You just can't demand too much of it and have to lower your expectations accordingly. If you can't or just don't want to do that, you should probably spend a bit more money and opt for a slightly more powerful mini PC that doesn't come with those weak Intel N100, N95 or N97 CPUs. For office purposes, watching videos or for small projects of some sort, such a cheap mini PC can be a great option though. If the price is decent, a device like today's Ninkier N10 is worth recommending for those on a tighter budget and for more lightweight use cases. What are your thoughts on such cheap mini PCs? What's the cheapest one you've discovered so far? If you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a like or to really annoy me, just hit that dislike button. With that being said, thank you so much for watching and until the next one.